Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and today we're going to talk about how to compute limits. Now, there are a boatload of different methods for computing limits out there, and they all apply in different situations depending on what the function you're working with, depending on what it looks like, okay? So today, we're only going to look at a couple of very introductory basic methods for computing limits, and these are the only ones that we're going to need in this course. For our purposes, this is all we need, but know in the back of your mind that there are a whole bunch of other techniques out there that we have not covered. Okay, so let's get to it. Let's let's start going through a couple of different ways of computing limits. And the first one is the simplest, okay? If the function that you're working with is continuous, then a way that you can compute the limit is you just plug in the value that x is approaching into the function itself. In other words, you know, if at, if the function is continuous at the number where x is approaching, well then this limit just equals what you get if you plug that number into the function itself, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, let's maybe talk in terms of a graph. If the function is continuous, what that means in terms of the graph is you can draw it without lifting your pencil, right? It means, hey, I can just keep walking along, walking along, nothing funny happens, I never jump instantly or, any, or have any holes or anything like that. Okay, so that's the graph of a continuous function down there. Okay, and well, if the function is continuous, then what it says is, well, if I wanna compute what the limit is as x approaches four, right, as, as my x value gets really close to four, remember what that means is I'm walking along the graph towards x equals four, I'm asking the question, what happens to my y value as x gets close to four? Well, my y value, based on the graph here, it looks like the y value is approaching one which is exactly the function value at four as well, okay? And it turns out, well, for continuous functions, that's true in general, okay? Whatever you get when you plug the x value into the function, in this case, if I plug in four, I get one. Well, that's exactly what the limit equals as x approaches four, f of x approaches one as well, okay? So in a sense, for continuous functions, limits don't do anything new. A limit as x approaches something, well, that's the same as just plugging into the function. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to do anything new, really. Okay, so continuous functions are really, really nice. Okay, you don't need, you can just shut your brain off and plug into the function like you normally would. Okay, so just a couple quick examples to pin down that idea. Limit as x goes to three of this function here. Well, you ask yourself, is that function continuous? Well, yeah, it's a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous, right? They're graphs, they just go up and down and up and down however many times, and then they shoot off to infinity in whichever direction. There's no jumps, there's no holes. Polynomials are continuous, okay? So if I want to compute this limit, all I have to do is I plug x equals 3 into this function. And when I do that, I get 3 squared, so that's going to be a 9, minus 6, plus 4. At the end of the day, you know, I, I, I you know, combine all of those guys, you add them up, you get 9 minus 6 plus 4. Well, that's 7, okay? So that's what the limit equals as well, okay? It's not just the function equals that, but also the limit equals that because it's a continuous function. Okay, next example, limit as x approaches two of this function here. Okay, so here I have to be a little bit careful because that function, it's not continuous, right? It's got gaps in its graph, okay? It's not continuous at x equals one and it's not continuous at x equals minus one, right? There are asymptotes there, but I don't care. I'm not asking about the limit as x approaches one or minus one. I'm asking about the limit as x approaches two. And at two, this function is continuous, right? I can just plug x equals two into this function and I get something that makes sense. It is continuous there, okay? Rational functions, right? If you have a polynomial divided by a polynomial, that's called a rational function. And rational functions, they're continuous as long as they're defined at the point in question. And this function is defined at x equals two, so you can just plug in, okay? If you plug in on, on the top, you get two plus three, so you get five on top. And on the bottom here, x squared minus one, so two squared minus one, four minus one, you get three on the bottom, okay? So you just get five over three as your final answer. Again, you can just plug x equals two into the function. You get, you know, you get the function value, but you also get the limit value, okay? So you don't have to be clever. All right, and one final example, e to the power of sine x. Well, exponential functions are continuous. Trigonometric functions are continuous as long as they're defined at the point in question. Um, so again, here, x approaching pi of this ugly function here, you don't have to be clever. That's a continuous function. You compose continuous functions, you still get continuous functions. So just plug in x equals pi, okay? So you're gonna get sine of pi, well, that's zero. So then you've got e to the power of zero, well, that's one. Okay, so that's your final answer. That's the function value and the limit value because that function is continuous. Okay, so continuous functions are easy. They're sort of nothing new. You just plug into the function. But if your function is not continuous where you're trying to take the limit, then sometimes you have to be more clever, okay? So let's go through sort of our first non-trivial case. Let's go through rational functions. How do you compute the limit of rational functions 
where it's not continuous. Well, it turns out that the trick is you just factor the top and bottom and cancel out whatever like factors that you can. Okay, if it's a rational function, remember that means it's a polynomial divided by polynomial. Just factor those top and bottom polynomials and cancel wherever you can. Okay, so for example, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of this function here? Okay, so, well, first off, before we try being clever, try just plugging into that function. See if it is continuous. See if it's just defined there. If we can plug in and we get a sensible answer, then that's our answer. Okay, so plug in x equals 2. See what happens. Well, if I plug in on the top, I'm going to get 4 minus 10 plus 6. Ah, oh, that's 0. And if I plug in on the bottom, I'm going to get 4 minus 2 minus 2. That's 0 as well. So I get 0 divided by 0. That's nonsense. Okay, so that's the thing that triggers in my mind oh, I've got to be more clever, okay? That's the thing that tells me this is not, this function's not continuous at x equals two, right? It's not even defined there. So I've got to be more clever. I can't use that case one of continu continuous functions method that I just went through. I've got to be more clever, okay? And the more clever trick that you do is, well, I just take that limit and I'm just going to factor the top and I'm going to factor the bottom. So however you like to factor uh, polynomials, right? You, you can, um, you know, some people have little mnemonics like, oh, I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to this constant term and add to this cross term. Or some people use a quadratic formula. However you like to, pa to factor these polynomials, that's your choice. Okay, when you factor the top, you're going to get x minus 2 times x minus 3. When you factor the bottom, you're going to get x minus 2 times x plus 1. Okay. And notice what happens here, okay? Both the top and bottom, they have x minus 2 as a factor. And, well, we actually already knew that that would happen, right? Because we said when we plug 2 into this function, we got 0 over 0. Okay, so that means 2 is a root of the top polynomial and the bottom polynomial. So that's why we're getting these x minus 2 factors here. Okay, but then the nice thing, what you can do is, oh, x minus 2 on the top and bottom, well, cancel, cancel. Right? Same thing on top and bottom, just cancel them out. So what you're left with after that then is, well, you're just left with the other terms, okay? You're left with the x minus 3 on top and the x plus 1 on bottom. And now we ask the question again, okay, now that I've simplified it, can I just plug in here, right? Is this a continuous function that I can just plug into and get my answer? And turns out now it is, okay? It's not continuous at x equals minus 1, but we don't care, okay? We're only concerned about what happens at x equals 2. Okay, so if we plug in x equals 2 into this function, well, on the top, you're going to get 2 minus 3, that's minus 1. And on the bottom, you're going to get 2 plus 1, that's 3. So you just get minus a third, and that's your final answer. Okay, so sort of the magic step, what worked here to make this limit computable was canceling out these x minus 2 factors. Okay, and let's think about this geometrically. What's happening here? What have we actually done? Okay, geometrically, if we plot this original function that we were talking about, this x squared minus 5x plus 6 over x squared minus x plus 2, sorry, minus 2, then the function looks like this. And so it's this thing that I've drawn over here on the right-hand side. And notice that, hey, it's got a hole at x equals 2. Okay, that's why it makes sense to say, you know, the function was not defined there, right? We got a 0 over 0. So there's this hole here. It's not actually defined at x equals 2. But the limit does exist because, I mean, if, you're, if you walk along this graph from the left or from the right towards x equals 2, your y value is approaching a particular number. In particular, we just showed that it's approaching minus a third. That's what that y value is. Okay. And, well, okay, let's focus on this function again. What we did, the way we got, got that answer was we factored the numerator and denominator. Okay. And then we canceled things out. And after we canceled things out, we got this new function, x minus 3 over x plus 1. And the graph of that function is the exact same as the original function, as this rational function on the left. These two functions have the exact same graph, except this function on the right here, this one does not have the whole at x equals 2 anymore. So now we can just plug into it to figure out what the limit value is. And that's what we did, okay? We just sort of removed the whole from the graph so that we could figure out what the limit is just by plugging in. All right, and then our last technique that we're going to introduce for computing values of limits is we're going to look at combinations of functions, okay? Lots of limits that we're going to want to compute are just sort of weird, you know, additions, subtractions, products, compositions, divisions of other nice functions, other nice limits that we do know how to compute, okay? And the short answer for how, do you, how you compute these limits is you just break it down into sort of individual limits, and as long as those individual limits exist, 
then you just, you know, add them up or multiply them naively how you would like to, okay? Just split up the limit over the sum or the product or the division or the composition or whatever, how like you wish that you could, and it turns out, you know, it works as long as each of the individual pieces that you break it up into actually exists. Okay, so that's a bit of a mouthful. Let's illustrate with an example, okay? Let's suppose that you were given this question. What is the limit as x approaches zero of co squared of x plus 3x squared minus 1, all divided by x squared. Okay, so at first you panic a little bit because that looks a lot more complicated than anything that we've seen so far, but I can notice bits and pieces of it that are fairly easy to deal with. And, you know, if I can just split it up into those pieces, then I'll be done. Okay, in particular, I see, hey, 3x squared divided by x squared, that looks easy enough to deal with. Why don't I just peel that piece off, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this limit as a sum of two limits. I'm gonna take this numerator here, I'm gonna take this fraction and split it up into a sum of two fractions, okay? In one of the fractions, I'm gonna have three x squared over x squared. So I've just peeled that off to the right. And then in the other fraction, I'm gonna have whatever's left over. I'm gonna have this cos squared minus one, cos squared minus one, still divide by x squared, right? It's just your usual rules for fractions, but with limit signs thrown out in front of everything, okay? So don't worry about the limit signs really, right? right? All that I've done here is, you know, I've split up this fraction into a sum of two fractions, and then you stick the same limit in front of both of them. Okay, and once you split it up in this way, the reason for doing that is this 3x squared over x squared, well, that just simplifies down to three, right? The x squareds cancel out and you just get limit as x goes to zero of three. Okay, the first limit is a little bit trickier to deal with. Cos squared x minus one over x squared. I don't know what that is, but we can relate it to a limit that we saw earlier in the previous video lecture, right? Cos squared minus one, that equals minus sine squared, right? Okay, so this is this goes back to some trig identities that hopefully you learned previously, right? Remember that cos squared plus sine squared equals one, okay? So that's what I'm using here. If cos squared plus sine squared equals one, we'll just rearrange things there and you're gonna find that cos squared minus one equals minus sine squared. Okay, and it's still got the over x squared on the bottom. And the reason that I'm using that trig identity, the reason that I'm replacing these two terms with minus sine squared is now we can use that sine x over x limit that I talked about in the previous video. Remember we talked about in the previous video how limit as x goes to zero of just sine x over x that equaled one, okay? So I'm gonna leech off of that limit that I already know from the previous video, okay? So what I'm gonna see is, well, sine x over x, that's gonna approach one, but I've gotta square it, and I've gotta stick a minus sign in front of it. So that's all I'm doing here, okay? So I'm squaring that one, and I'm sticking a minus sign in front of it. And then plus this limit here, well, that's just three. Limit, what happens to three as x goes to zero? Well, that's, the three doesn't care about x, right? There's no variable in that expression. It's just constant. So it's still just plus three at the end, okay? And then you just combine all of that junk and you get two, right? Minus, well, one squared is one. So then it's minus one and then plus three on that, you get two at the end of the day, okay? So when you have a weird composite function like this, right? You know, addition and quotients of a whole bunch of functions, just break it down into individual limits that each individually exist, and then you can add up their answers. And that's the trick in that situation. All right, so that'll do it for today's lecture. I will see you guys later when we start talking about derivatives and tangent lines and rates of change and all of that sort of stuff. So I'll see you then.